So the idea of the end of knowledge. Um, end, at least in English, right, is a very kind of mixed term, ambiguous term. Uh, it, it, in the first instance, end is normally understood as the terminal point, right, where things come to completion, right? Uh, but also end means uh, the goal, right? That in some sense there is a kind of complete, you know, it's not just that it's ended in the sense of finished, but that something that you were trying to do has been completed, right? So there's a kind of teleological, as we say in philosophy, kind of understanding of end as well. And these two notions of end uh, coexist, uh, you know, not only in English, but in many languages kind of, um, ambiguously, uh, and, and I want to play on that amb ambiguity because there's a sense in which um, when we talk about the end of knowledge, um, part of what you might say drives the goal, if you think about knowledge as having a goal, uh, is the fact that uh, we're kind of limited in a way, that we have to sort of think about what it is exactly we're trying to do when we're producing knowledge. And here I would say, uh, and, and again, this has been very much part of my work from, uh, from the early period where uh, I, I actually wrote a book uh, that was published uh, 25 years ago now called Philosophy, Rhetoric, and the End of Knowledge, right? So this was in 1993. Uh, and in more recent years, I've been talking about transhumanism and posthumanism and things of that kind. Um, and, and this has something to do with the end of knowledge as well. And what connects these two projects uh, is the idea that uh, part of what we want to talk about when we talk about the end of knowledge is something about the nature of the human condition and where it's going, okay? Because knowledge is such a big deal in philosophy because in some sense it's regarded as the uh, the point at which our humanity or whatever it is uh, that makes us what we are is most clearly exemplified, right? What we know is in a sense who we are, at least in terms of how we relate to each other, okay? Uh, and, and while one can kind of quarrel about the, this in various ways, nevertheless, I, I think when one talks about the kind of knowledge that one thinks is worth promoting, you're saying something about the person, okay? Um, and, and, and I believe that very clearly. Um, and one of the problems I would say with modern theories of knowledge, uh, especially after Kant, uh, it has been that there's been this tendency to think about knowledge in a very abstract way, which is to say detached from the bearers and producers and consumers of the, that knowledge, right? So in other words, we talk about what is true as such, right, what we should believe as such without really thinking much about who are these people who are the believers in the truth? Who are they? What are they? What kind of beings are they? Um, I think we just sort of assume they're humans, but then anyone who knows anything about the history and sociology of the human condition will say, well, what human means has been to, subject to enormous variation, even in our own time. And so to just talk about what you should believe if something is true, blah, 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 as a lot of epistemology often talks about, is to kind of, in a way, talk about this at a level that's so abstract that it becomes kind of irrelevant for any way in which philosophy might have a relationship to the way in which people live their lives. And so my concern about the end of knowledge comes from this kind of idea, namely that academic philosophy tends to treat epistemology in a very uh, abstract way, and so to just put it very succinctly, in, a, in philosophy there is a strong distinction drawn still between epistemology and ontology. Right? So ontology is about the nature of being in the world, and epistemology is the nature of knowing, and these are treated as separate. But of course, from my standpoint, it's hard to know what we should know unless we know what kind of being we are and what would be appropriate for a being of our kind to know. Okay? 
This is an open, so, so there's a, a, a big issue here that's opened up. Now, when we talk about the end of knowledge in this context, okay, then we have to think about, let's say we start with humans as the beings who are the knowers. We've got two options. One option is that we are going for making, or somehow, you know, if we're trying to improve the nature of our knowledge, we are trying to make people better, better knowers, make them smarter, etc. When we say that, when we say we want to make people, make people better, smarter, knowers, etc., we're starting with the assumption that the people we're working with are fixed. In other words, that they've got a certain kind of capacity, uh, and I think this is very much true of classical epistemology, that you imagine a kind of Cartesian knower, an individual who's kind of a mortal human being with the kind of capacities that we normally think about, and then we're trying to tra talk about how do we improve the capacities of those people, people who are like that, who are a bit like, you know, so homo sapiens, maybe homo sapiens who are a bit enhanced in some way with technology or something like that, but basically individual homo sapiens. What we're not talking about when we talk about the end of knowledge normally is the idea of making better people, right? Making people better is what I was saying before. Now I'm talking about making better people. Okay, so there's a difference. These are things, are, these are quite different things. Because what we're talking about then is that if we actually want to improve the way in which we know the world, we may have to do something to ourselves in a very fundamental way in order to be in that position to know the world. Okay? So this is a move from making people better to making better people. Now this is a very controversial idea, okay? I'm not the person to who has invented this idea, but I'm putting this on the table because when we talk about the end of knowledge, there is an open question about the, the ontology of the knower. Who is the knower? Okay? And as I say, classical epistemology assumes that it's individual homo sapiens, and individual homo sapiens then gather together and so forth. And that's how knowledge is produced. But then there's a question of maybe we need a kind of better knower. And there are lots of ways of thinking about this. And this has, you know, this is where issues of transhumanism come in. Uh, and uh, I, in recent years, I've been writing about this idea. And so transhumanism is the idea that if we want to realize the kinds of interests and, and concerns that have, let's say, animated the idea that we should know as much as we can and, you know, understand the entire universe and the cosmos and the sort of thing that, you know, physics and many of the other sciences still aspire to, that if we really want to take that kind of idea seriously, then we need to be a different sort of being. In other words, the idea of what we're trying to do is fine. The problem is we're not up to the task the way we are. And that means an ontological change. Okay? And this is when the end of knowledge to me gets kind of interesting because it means that if we really want to live up, you know, it's, it's an issue of like you might say, um, instead of just talking the talk, walking the walk. If what we want to do is to understand the entire nature of reality and the cosmos and all these things that physicists keep on talking about, right? So Newton, Einstein, all the rest of them, the idea is to understand everything in terms of a few fundamental principles. Then what kind of being could do that? Would it necessarily be human in the sense of Homo sapiens or would it need to be enhanced? Okay? And this is where I have been exploring in, in the last 10 years um, the issues of transhumanism. What would, it, what would be the relevant forms of enhancement for human beings to be able to actually live up to the normative standards that classical philosophy has put forward? And not just classical philosophy, but also 
physics as we understand it today, because physicists are still pursuing this idea. This is not just some kind of illusion you know, that people came up with. It's still very much part of modern science, and the question becomes, how do we become the kind of being who could, in principle, understand everything? And so part of what I've looked at in this regard, um, and, and, and it's just something that I have begun looking at in the last few years, is, of course, this movement within Russia called the Cosmist Movement, Russian Cosmism, okay? Starting with Fedorov and Vernyatsky, all these people from the 19th, 20th centuries um, who were, in a sense, kind of imagining that human beings uh, were not just limited by how they began biologically, but, in a sense, have this kind of cosmic purpose. Now, I think this kind of ontology that's implied with Cosmism is in fact very much along the lines of what contemporary transhumanism is trying to propose. And while people uh, you know, in the West have not really taken on board much of this cosmic stuff yet, nevertheless, I think, uh, I think in the long term this will be seen as very much ahead of the curve uh, in terms of if we want to tr take seriously kind of the aspirations and goals which even contemporary physics still strives for, which is to say a kind of unified, comprehensive understanding of universe, okay? And so I think that when we think about the end of knowledge, my own standpoint, which makes it different from a lot of other people's standpoint, is um, I'm willing to take quite seriously the more extreme claims that have been made about humans' capacity to know things, but I think that the, the, the price of that is that we will need to change the kind of being we are materially.